Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to Gather and Go, the podcast that helps you plan, promote, and lead better trips. I'm your host, Brian Jewell, and I am simply elated that you decided to spend some time with us today. And as always, our promise to you is we're going to do everything we can to make that investment of your time worth your while. Today, we're doing that in a featured conversation with Diana Heckler of D Tours Travel. Diana is a longtime travel enthusiast and travel advisor who has developed a really deep expertise on finding and delivering unique, one of a kind, once in a lifetime experiences for travelers. And you are going to love what she has to say. Before we get there, though, let's talk about some travel news you may have missed. There is now legislation in the U.S. Senate to ban hotel resort fees. Following several months of tough talk from the Biden administration about banning resort fees and concert ticket service fees and similar unpopular pricing schemes, uh, Senators Richard Blumenthal and Sheldon Whitehouse introduced uh, the Junk Fee Prevention Act in March. Now, this legislation would force hotels and third parties that sell hotel rooms to, quote, clearly and conspicuously display in each advertisement and when a price is first shown to a consumer, the total price of the good or service, end quote. Now, in addition to resort fees, the legislation would also prohibit airlines from charging fees for parents who want to sit next to their minor children during flights. Now, resort fees aren't exactly widespread. Only about 6% of hotels charge them, uh, according to the American Hotel and Lodging Association. Uh, but at properties that do, those fees averaged $26 per night in 2022. Now, so far, other senators haven't said much about their thoughts on the legislation, so there's no indication yet whether it has a realistic chance to pass through the legislature. Well, now it's time for the road tip segment of our show. Now, this is the time in every episode where we dip into our uh, deep well of travel knowledge and share with you some tips that have helped us in our time on the road and we think will help you have better experiences with less hassle as you and your clients go out on your adventures. So I remember the night, this must have been, I don't know, five or six years ago, I was in a hotel room. I had just gotten in bed. I was really tired. I was ready to sleep, but I could not get enough darkness. Uh, I love sleeping in a really dark room. I don't have any lights, anything blinking in my room at home because any of those uh, blinking or shining things just tends to distract me and keeps me awake. So I'm lying in this hotel room and I'm noticing that uh, right in front of me, uh, there is a little uh, green blinking light on the TV. It's weird that the TV was blinking green, even though it was off. So I got up out of bed and uh, dug around for a notebook or something to prop up in front of that light to block the light so that I could go to sleep. And I thought I had done a good job. And I got back in bed and I realized that uh, a few feet away uh, on the little micro fridge that's in a lot of hotel rooms, the microwave had a little clock, a little LED clock that was green and also blinking and was right in my line of sight. And so I had to get up and deal with that too. Before I was able to go to bed that night, I must have covered seriously three or four little blinking lights in the hotel room. What I discovered was two things. Number one, those lights can be super annoying and can really make a difference if you are trying to get some sleep. But number two, there are lots of things you can use in the room to cover up those lights. My favorite things to use are those little tabletop signs, tent cards, uh, the little advertisements that the hotel staff actually leaves in the room. I find them super convenient to just grab from wherever they were, move them in front of whatever light source you need to block and leave them there for the duration of your stay. But you know what else you can do? Well, you can completely rearrange the room. There is no rule that says you have to use a hotel room exactly as you find it. So if there is a phone in the room that's in an inconvenient place for you, unplug it, move it, take it somewhere else. If the alarm clock is uh, too close to the bed or too far from the bed, unplug it, move it, take it somewhere else. You can move furniture, you can move tables, you can move side chairs, you can uh, turn things around, unplug the TV if you need to. During the time when you're in that room, you have paid for the privilege of sleeping there and you should feel comfortable doing whatever it takes to make that room right for you. So use the uh, tent cards and the table toppers that the hotel has left you to block out light sources 
And if that's not getting the job done, you get out of bed, start unplugging things. Even if you have to plug them in later, it's worth it for that great night sleep. Now, there is your road tip of the week. Now, before we move on, I want to share a little bit of news from us. If you're one of the many travel planners who's been wrestling with the challenges of planning travel and taking people on tours in 2023, we have a resource that you are going to love. Our buyer's guide for the group travel industry is full of expert insight and information specifically on how to lead your best trips and operate a thriving business in the current environment we find ourselves in. Now, this is a free digital guide you can download from our website. It doesn't cost a thing. And if you do, you're going to get uh, industry expertise. You're going to hear from leaders throughout tourism and creative thinkers offering their insights on issues such as keeping costs down as inflation goes up, solving travel problems with creative thinking, and attracting and retaining great hospitality staff. This is all essential information for operating successful travel ventures in 2023. You can get it at our website right now, grouptravelleader.com slash buyers. That's B-U-Y-E-R-S, grouptravelleader.com slash buyers. I'm going to drop that in the show notes to make it easy for you to find. Download that today. Get some insight on solving your biggest travel problems. You won't regret it. I promise. Well, it's just about time for us to move into our featured conversation with Diana Heckler. Before we do that, though, let me encourage you to hang around to the end of the interview, because after we're done there, well, I have some more thoughts about junk fees in the travel industry and the role they play in the economics of tourism. And I'm going to share those with you in the hot minute. You won't want to miss that. We will be right back with Diana Heckler. All right, everybody. My guest today is a veteran travel advisor who specializes in helping clients uncover extraordinary experiences in destinations around the world. She's the founder of D Tours Travel and has been named among the country's top 25 travel agents by Travel Agents Magazine. Her new book, Strolling with Your Elephant, Perfect Moments in Travel, highlights more than 80 of her most memorable travel experiences. Diana Heckler, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Love to talk about travel. Uh, yeah, we could we could do this for hours, I'm sure. So we're going to talk about the book and some of the experiences that uh, you write about there. But before we get there, I would love for you to tell our audience how you got into travel, because you didn't start at the beginning of your career thinking that, you know, one day you'd be one of the country's top travel agents, right? That is correct. And actually, my earliest aspiration was to be secretary of state. And I was a history major in college, and I went and got a, a, an expensive graduate degree in foreign policy. And and I'll always be interested in, in that. But um, the time came when I began to think about whether I was really going to pursue this dream. I had been at home with uh, two small children and was sort of thinking about, OK, it's time to, to, to either make good on this or change my, my goals. And what happened was that a friend of mine, some friends of mine called me up one day and said, you guys, you and your husband just went to Spain, right? And I said, yeah. And they said, we're thinking of going to Spain. Can we come over and talk to you? And I said, sure. So they came over and I had my maps all spread out and I counseled them about a first trip to Spain, probably being Andalusia as the most interesting part. And they loved it. And I spent an hour with them. And when they came back from their trip, I think I was their first phone call. Wow. Um, wow. And I sort of thought, wow, could I make a business of this? Would people pay me to do this? And would it give me the same the same entree into international affairs and traveling and interacting with people from other countries and cultures that my former goal of being secretary of state was going to do. And the answer was happily yes. Um, yes. People would pay me. I have people who, who are so happy that they don't have to plan their own travel. So the short answer is yes, there is plenty of room for a travel advisor who really knows their stuff and can operate in an international uh, venue. And that's what I chose to do. Yeah. So how long was the process from helping those friends with their Spain trip to opening your doors as a travel business? About 10 minutes. <laughs> 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 no, not quite that short. But I really was intrigued by the fact that they called me right away. 
And, and funnily enough, they've never been my clients, incidentally. Um, and I don't <laughs> think that they know that they were the impetus for, the, for my, my career, my brilliant career. Um, it was not a long period of time. I actually thought, interestingly, because uh, this, this program is, is for group travel leaders, um, I really thought I was going to do a lot of group travel at the beginning. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I still do. But I found that there were so many people who wanted their individual travel plan that the group travel is now a small part of what I do. I, as I said, I do do it, but um, it's really lots of people who want custom travel. They said they don't want to be part of not uh, not a group that is formed with their friends. That's still a lot of fun, but not necessarily being part of a tour group where they don't know other people and, and they just feel like they want their own time, et cetera. So uh, you started your business at a time when there was a lot of upheaval in the world of travel agents, you know, airlines were cutting commissions and people were realizing I'm not going to be able to run a business based on just writing air tickets. Right. So you kind of came in with this mindset that said, I have to do business differently. I have to find different things for my clients. What were you looking for then? And, and bring us up to now, what are you looking for uh, for your clients that uh, sets those trips apart and makes them come back with really cool memories. Well, I think the first thing to understand is, and you were, and you are correct about the time that I entered the industry where the commission cuts were uh, making people who had lived on that a very unhappy. And so mm -hmm. that was a, that was a, a period of discontent, I would say in the travel industry, but once they were gone and people recognized that that was really not going to be a bread and butter, you know, operation, um, you began, the, the industry began to attract people who said, Hey, I have an expertise in this part of the world or this part of the country, or maybe it's Disney world. It can be anything. Um, and so what I would say is you have people who want to add value to the equation. And I do believe that that's true in this market today is that if, if all you can do is promote a particular hotel, um, there, you're probably not going to be all that successful because Expedia will undercut you by $10 every time. Yeah. So that's really not a good business model to pursue. And so all along, what I started out with was my expertise in Europe. I had done a lot of Europe travel. I started out as a backpacker, as a college student, one of the greatest experiences of my life. I wouldn't train it, train it for anything. Um, and so my clients, again, want to come to me because they can do their own plane tickets. You know, they might want to use their points. They, they maybe have a credit left over. Um, that's the least of what I do. My business is all about what happens when you get off the plane. Mm. And when mm. I am sending somebody, let's say, to a major capital that many people who've traveled abroad visit, let's say it's London or Paris or Rome, there's always things that you can add that are beyond the Colosseum and the Vatican and the Sistine Chapel. I mean, you should go see those things. I, I love them too. They're fantastic. But you can also go and see if you're there on the 15th of March, the reenactment of Caesar's assassination in the place where it happened, because a local historical society um, operates that. If you're in Venice, again, another place that many people go to, um, there's something that occurs on the first Sunday of September every year called the Regatta Storica, the historic regatta, where they have boat races on the Grand Canal all day long. Okay, boat races, you know, a little bit goes a long way, but when they start their day, they float all their historic boats down the Grand Canal, including the boats that the doges used to ride on. And they'll have, you know, this incredibly beautiful, ornate, lovely boat that was designed to wow the masses because that's what the doges always wanted to do. And they'll have a 12-man team all dressed in Renaissance livery, you know, pulling through the Grand Canal. It is an incredible sight. Um, all you have to do is know that you want to be there that first Sunday in September. And, and that's free. So there's always things you can do, even in the most visited cities. And, and I think that that's the purpose of the book, was to try to say to people, it's not necessarily about finding a place that no one has been to, because that's harder and harder these days. Our, our world gets smaller all the time. Uh, it's about when you're in these places, making them your own making your experience something unique to you. And, and it may be because you have a special interest. Maybe, maybe you love historic regattas. Maybe you love el elephants. Uh, you know, it's interesting. One of my friends wrote to me uh, yesterday and said, oh, your book arrived. And I, I love the title. And, and he said, I've been a 30-year donor to this rescue organization in Tennessee for elephants. So I would want to go and do that elephant experience. And somebody else wrote to me and said, I loved reading the book. I loved particularly reading about kayaking under the Pont du Card. 
and somebody else says to me, oh, the transatlantic crossing on the Queen Mary on an ocean liner, I totally want to do that. It's different for everyone. And these are all things that people can do, but you need to ask, you need to know that they're available. Yeah. So um, you somehow developed a technique, a philosophy for uncovering these sorts of things, because they're not things that, you know, you are going to find out about when you check in your hotel uh, or something like that. So share with us how you kind of started uncovering these things and what is the process that guides you for finding cool new travel experiences? Well, first of all, I would like to say that for anyone in any business, whether it's travel or, or running a laundromat or, or saving animals, you really need to be involved in your in your your industry and community. You need to be reading the trade press. You need to be going to conferences. My agency belongs to Ensemble, and so and I always go to conferences and I always read the trade press. So I, and, and it's really important to be hearing what the trends are in your industry. And so, about I would say seven, eight years ago, people began writing about this. They began talking about it at conferences about authentic travel and how people really want authentic travel. And I listened. I listened. And I realized that that was true in my own client world as well. And I began to think, okay, I know about all these experiences. Am I sharing them all with my clients? So I began to think about that. Am I mentioning? So when somebody wants to go to Peru and see Machu Picchu, again, that's a bucket list item for many people, but I had been to a conference and one of the speakers had talked about doing the, um, uh, the boat cruise through the headwaters of the Amazon, which also happened to be in Peru. You go to Iquitos and you get on the boat for three or four or seven days. And so when I went to Machu Picchu with my husband, I said, David, we're, we're going to do this thing in the Amazon too. He's like, okay. <laughs> he, was very, he was very amenable to my ideas. And so we went and it was phenomenal. It's one of the things I wrote about in the book as well. What it taught me was that, again, keep your ears open when you're at conferences, what are people talking about? And then recognizing that when I go to conferences, when I'm at the conference in Cannes every December, that is, you know, for top travel agents, and I'm meeting with not only hotels, but also great uh, local tour companies, DMCs, destination management companies. Am I asking them the all important question? Tell me something I don't know. Mm. And the more times I ask that question, the more interesting information I uncovered. And so it's just, it's a wonderful thing that people keep creating new and interesting things to do. So one time I was at a conference and talking to these people, a company I'd never heard of before. And I was saying, tell me something new about going to Japan. I know you can go to Kyoto and Tokyo. And she said, well, you can go to the, see the katana sword making village. What's that? What's a katana? Oh, that's a samurai sword. Really? Yeah, let me send you the information. So that's again in my book, it's like, oh, you go to see like the seven master craftsmen who who make the swords, all the seven parts of them. There's one person who does nothing but wrap the cord. Like that's an art form. So for someone who loves Japanese culture or or anything like that, adding that to a day, you know, in, in Kyoto, yeah, who wouldn't want to do that? But even when I was in at a conference in December this past year. This person in Paris said to me, uh, I said, tell me something I don't know about Paris. And his answer was, I said, one of my clients was a, a woman taking her eight-year-old granddaughter to Paris in May. And he said, well, we could have Gustav Eiffel meet them on top of the Eiffel Tower and explain how the Eiffel Tower works and what it was all about and how it came to be. I thought, that's pretty interesting. I'd probably like to do that too. I'm not eight years old, but I think that would be pretty interesting. So there's no shortage of new things that are being developed all the time. And that's that's a wonderful development for the industry, I think. So it sounds like a big part of your strategy is just asking questions consistently and, and asking the right questions. And maybe you're going to ask something that inspires the person you're talking to. And maybe they're going to sort of develop like at the Eiffel Tower, develop an idea kind of on the spot. Is Have you found that happening quite often? I have. I really have. And it's interesting also because there are some uh, local tour companies and, and hotels that, that totally understand this and others that are really still doing the basics. And maybe it's because a lot of travel agents really do offer just the basics and haven't really 
absorb this concept of authentic, specific, unique travel. And I think that the, the more that do, the better it is for our industry. So it's important to ask the right question. It's important to keep um, thinking of new ways to think about things, even in even in really well visited destinations. So yes, it's a strategy. Always asking, always asking, always asking, and 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 it's and and you can ask anybody. The idea about um, kayaking under the Pont de Gard came from my sales rep for one of the uh, river cruise companies, and I think he had written about it in one of the newsletters. And I thought that's pretty cool. I'd like to do that again. The best tour companies get this. And and if somebody says to me, oh, we offer a cooking class. I'm like, well, that's very nice, but we're, I'm way beyond a cooking class. You know, I'm way beyond a yoga class on the roof. Great. Some hotels, some DMCs get it. Some, some really don't. And I think that the more you understand and really integrate this into everything that you do, the better your results are. You were uh, kind enough to send me a, a copy of the book. And as I was reading through it, uh, earlier this week, I, I jotted down some notes of, uh, about the experiences that really stood out to me personally. And what's great is, you know, you've got 80 of them in there. So as you said, there's going to be something different for everybody. Uh, I love the idea about, you know, uh, being in Australia and exploring Uluru with an Aboriginal elder or, you know, hunting for dinosaur fossils in Canada. Fondue picnic in the Swiss Alps sounds amazing. Swimming on the rooftop at TWA terminal at JFK. So those were the ones that grabbed me as I read through. Uh, I'll put you on the spot a little bit and ask if there are a few that are just super close to your heart that you might be able to say, these are some of my very favorites in the book. That's a really easy question. Sure. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> the, the title of the book is Strolling with Your Elephant. And that was that comes from my experience up in uh, in the Golden Triangle in Thailand, where there's an elephant refuge. And these elephants have all been rescued from, in my case, the streets of Bangkok, if you can believe it, um, and circuses or construction brigades. And this is a wonderful program where this man who runs this hotel has uh, invited people who own elephants who are using them in ways that are painful for us to think about. He invites them with their elephant to come to the refuge. He offers them a job and a place to sleep and the elephant can stay there. And hopefully, and, and he's not buying an elephant. He's not depriving anyone of a livelihood. But the elephant and the owner can have a different kind of a life. So once a day, three times a day, the elephants go for walks in the jungle for exercise. And if you're staying at the adjacent hotel, you can go along. Wow. And it is incredible. I, I think the last sentence in my in my little chapter there was about wanting to hug my my elephant after my two hour encounter with them. And and like many people, I had seen elephants in zoos and circuses, you know, from the time I was a child. But to have this experience when the elephant was simply going about her business and to know that she was leading a really nice life and that no, as I said, no one's, no one's cultural sensitivities were being impinged on, no one's livelihood had been taken from them to save an elephant. This is just a really smart program. And obviously they're not saving every elephant that they could, but they're saving some. And, and when you are in your hotel room, you can look out over the grassy field below and see them. They're overnight. They're just hanging out there because that's where they're now living. So to go for a walk, a stroll with an elephant in the forest was mind blowing. It was fantastic. The other one that was really uh, incredible was waltzing at the Hofburg Palace in Vienna. They have balls all year long in Vienna and they, they waltz constantly. And I was invited on a program for four days. I went to Austria for four days. But while we were in Vienna, we were invited to the summer ball, which is held at the uh, riding school, the Spanish riding school, which is part of the palace. They have debutantes and their escorts who waltz first. And then around uh, nine o'clock, they open the floor for everyone to waltz and they waltz until 4 a.m. And, and you can also go, yeah, I know. And, and then in the place where the horse's stalls are, they have another dance floor which with a rock band. So you can, you can rock and roll or you can go and waltz. And what was interesting was that, okay, my waltz skills were a little rusty. So Elmire Dance Studio, which is downtown right near the beautiful soccer hotel, uh, offers a one hour waltz lesson. So, okay, I practiced the day before and I brought my ball gown and there was a lot of champagne and I found myself waltzing in the floor of the palace. Oh, I should also say we arrived in horse-drawn carriages. Um, oh, nice. The hotel gave us a hair and makeup session. That afternoon we had 
we had like cocktails and bubbles beforehand and then we went to the ball but what was most interesting so a it's a cinderella moment really or a prince charming moment wh whichever side you're on um it was incredible as i said the orchestra's playing there are these colored lights all over playing all over the walls uh it is a, an incredible scene to think you're at the palace you're a commoner but you're at the palace but they have balls all the time and the tickets are not very expensive maybe like 100 euros so it's not like you have to spend a thousand dollars not hard to do you just need to know this is possible now uh, you you cover more than 30 countries in the book which is phenomenal for people who love international travel some people for a variety of reasons love to travel in the u.s or only travel in the u.s or their customers you know are going to do four u.s trips a year and maybe only one international trip you know every two or three years so give us some examples of these kinds of experiences that you've had domestically that still kind of resonate in that same way yeah absolutely so um i happen to love history i think i might have mentioned earlier i was a history major in college and so and i also grew up in washington dc in addition to Julius Caesar having the most famous assassination, one of the other famous ones is, of course, for Abraham Lincoln. So one of the things that you can do in Washington is you can trace his path after the assassination, which is something that probably most of us have some general sense of, but it's actually not very hard to do. You can start with a presentation at Ford's Theater in the morning. Again, this is not a costly thing. Um, you can walk over to this, what is now a Chinese restaurant, that happens to have a small plaque on the wall that says this is the this was Mary Surratt's boarding house where the conspirators lived for the you know several weeks before and then you can uh, you know go to the alley behind Ford's theater where he jumped onto the horse breaking his leg you can go to Samuel Mudd's house uh, in Maryland where this unwitting doctor has set his leg you know these two travelers knocked on the door in the middle of the night and he needed medical attention. And then you can go to where they uh, took refuge in these, um, this nasty like Marsh Glen, where he wrote like a, 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 a this long diatribe about how he was so misunderstood. Poor John Wilkes Booth. Um, and then you can go to the the spot near the farmhouse where he actually met his end. That's not hard to do. That's the, again, that's almost free. That's the cost of a gallon of gas. You can do this all in a day. And I, I would start at Ford's Theater. But for somebody who loves history, that's not an uninteresting thing to do. That's amazing to know that this was a real person. These the events really took place and you can be in the place where these all happened. Uh, and then one of my other favorites is visiting the uh, TWA terminal at JFK, which has been recently reopened as a, a kind of a museum with some with some opportunities for revenue <laughs> for, for the people who own it. Uh, so there's a hotel there. And some of those hotel rooms look out at the runways, the active runways of JFK. But I also happen to love aviation. And so to go to the TWA terminal, which I remember flying out of back in the day, it, you know, this is this beautiful aero serenin winged thing. It looks like a gull's wings. It's a really iconic building. And it sat vacant for 20 years after, basically after TWA folded. Uh, and so they've got the hotel, but they've also got displays in in the interior it's it's still recreated to look like twa had it it's got one of those um i think they're called an electromechanical you know destination board where the the things go flop 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 flop, flop, flop as they spin to the new destinations uh they've they've got an exhibit on the uh the uh, uniforms for the stewardesses and pilots and they were all stewardesses back in the day they've got the constellation which is this big old 1930s plane which actually served as Air Force One for Dwight Eisenhower. That's parked on the tarmac and it's now a bar. You can go up the steps and there's a stewardess who serves cocktails and you can either fit, sit in forward facing seats side by side or you know, uh, facing inward along the front, but that's fun. And in the winter time, they have a skating rink. You can look out your windows and, and see people skating below you on the tarmac there. But the best part of all is the rooftop terrace where they uh, have a very happy group of people and bartenders. And you look out over the active runways of JFK and it is really a fun place. And there's an infinity pool that is heated. Uh, I have a picture of myself in October with a glass of wine, plastic cup, in the pool with my girlfriend. <laughs> it was just lovely. The, the air was cool, but the water was warm. And there we were on top of the world. And what's really interesting about being up there is that it's such a special and unique place 
and, and people are happy up there. So, so these experiences range from almost free or, or really free. You can go into the TWA terminal for free um, and you can look at the various you know, exhibits that they have there or very expensive. If you want to tag the rhino's ear in South Africa, okay, you've got to be on a safari and that's going to cost you something. So uh, you do some group travel planning. Many of our listeners are planning for groups. Uh, what are the unique wrinkles to finding these experiences for groups and running the logistics of them for groups? Because some, some things that you can do with four people are much harder with 40 people. So are there special things you should take into consideration when you're planning for a group? I would say that, again, you want to be working with, uh, I mean, I, I would hope that people who are running groups are working with a partner because it's pretty damn hard to do it all yourself. So if you're working with a partner, they're going to be used to handling groups. So for instance, you know, doing the, the waltzing at the Hofburg thing, we were a group of 12. That was no problem. Uh, doing the Sydney Harbor Bridge climb uh, was, again, in a group. Uh, that's just, okay, if you have 40 people, you're going to have four groups of 10 people each, but you can all do it in succession, one group behind the other. So there really aren't a lot of things that would be difficult. I mean, certainly doing a bike tour and staying in the Lockmaster houses along the CNO Canal, okay, they only sleep eight people. So yeah. there you have some constraints, but that's kind of unusual. Most of the other things really would be very easy to do. Again, all you really need to know is who your local tour operator is and that they have that ability. And if they say to you, I've never done that before, I'd say, call me and I'll tell you who offers this. I'm not, the, the book is not designed to be proprietary and that somebody has to do this through me. I hope that group leaders and that travel advisors will use the book as a tool in their own business. And if they call me up and say, my group wants to do this, but I don't know who it is. I'll say, here, here's the contact. This is who you want to talk to. And my, my contact at the tour company will be delighted that I've given them another piece of business. Yeah, that's amazing. The book is Strolling with Your Elephant, Perfect Moments in Travel. Where can people find it? You can find it at barnesandnoble.com online. Um, you can find it at uh, Amazon online, of course. Uh, certainly, there, there's no problem with Kindle, uh, with the uh, audiobook. It's on Audible, uh, the uh, soft cover they've got. Um, so Barnes & Noble and Amazon are the easy ones. Kindle also, uh, as I said, Audible. It's available in a lot of places. And, of course, you can always go into your bookstore and say, I'd like to order this book because it certainly is available for order. Any bookstore can, can get it. And what is the best way for people to connect with you or follow you or learn more about what you're doing? Well, I've got a Detours Travel Facebook page, which is literally Detours Travel, D with a with no E, D dot Tours Travel. I've got an Instagram account also for Detours Travel. You can look me up that way. Those are the easiest ways. Uh, so before we let you go, uh, we have a series of questions we ask every guest, and these are just for fun. So uh, you can relax and just uh, answer uh, from the hip. Uh, first question is, when you book travel for yourself, do you book a window seat or an aisle seat? Window seat, for sure. I would never want to give up that view. I love that bird's eye view. You know, I live in New York, and the takeoffs and landings in New York are spectacular. It's a very watery place. A lot of times you see the Statue of Liberty. Uh, you fly up the East River. I actually came back from Detroit visiting my son recently, and our pilot, we flew up the Hudson, and our pilot said, Ladies and gentlemen, out the right side of the aircraft, you've got a beautiful view of Manhattan. And it was true. Why would I not sit by the window? Yeah, makes total sense. So what's one thing in your carry-on that you wouldn't travel without? Oh, one thing in my, um, my headphones, <laughs> my noise-canceling <laughs> headphones. Because well, airplanes are noisy places. And particularly if you are flying a long distance, um, you know, it's, it can be very hard to sleep. And it's really interesting that even with music playing in your headphones, that's really different than hearing the galley crew clattering silverware or somebody coughing behind you. So the noise canceling headphones. Yeah, that's that's the one. Yeah, I hear you. I'm the same way. So if you had a free airline pass and a week with nothing else to do, where would you be headed next? Italy. <laughs> yeah. Italy, Italy, Italy. Yeah. People used to ask me, what's your favorite city? And I used to say, oh, I don't know. I've had so many wonderful visits to so many places. But 
when I think back about it, I really think that that's uh, a place that I'm perpetually surprised by, perpetually discovering new things by. The food is great. The people are nice. I love history. You can always find a Roman ruin somewhere. <laughs> you can always find that. Uh, but the lake districts are beautiful. There's always more to discover. And some of it is just drop dead gorgeous. You can't believe how beautiful it is. I happen to love the island of Capri. And, and, and this is also true in Venice. I find myself on repeat visits taking this exact same photos I've taken before because I know that I've taken this picture, but I somehow want to try to capture it, which of course you really can't. You really have to go. Uh, but it's funny, as I said, I, I know I've taken this picture before, <laughs> but uh, that's a really special place to me. Uh, that's amazing. So final question, what is something you have seen or done on the road that you wish you could go back and experience again with somebody you love? Um, I think the elephant experience in Thailand, because I don't think there would be very many people who would not be as transfixed as I was. I'm, I'm not an animal. I mean, I love animals, of course. I mean, probably most of us do in some way, shape or form. But it's not like I am a, an animal rights activist. I'm not, that's not where I spend a lot of my time. And yet I just felt this incredible connection to this magnificent and gentle beast in a way that I could never have imagined unless I had done it. And it's not something you can do when an elephant is at a, at a distance from you. You have to be up close. And I didn't ever feel that I was in danger from this giant beast next to me. Instead, I felt she was magnificent and gentle and kind. She just happens to be very, very large. But she was just going about her business. And, and at the end of the day, I wanted to hug her. And I felt, I mean, it sounds kind of crazy, but I felt this, this bonding between beast and human. And that's, that was a surprise to me. I knew I would like it. I didn't know in what way I would like it. Wow, uh, that's amazing. That's wonderful. Well, Diana, it's been a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks so much for uh, sharing all your knowledge. And uh, we wish you the best with the book. And uh, we'll have to bring you back on to talk travel again sometime soon. Thanks, Brian. It's really fun. I love talking travel. I would do it even if I didn't make a living from it. Happy to do it. Well, I sure hope you enjoyed that conversation with Diana Heckler. I always love talking with people like her who have this infectious love of travel. It's hard not to fall in love with the places she has been when you hear her talk about them. Now, there are a couple things Diana said that I want to make sure we hit again because I think they are really, really good advice, especially if you are a travel planner trying to stand out in a crowded travel market. Now, when she was talking about unearthing great travel experiences, Diana said, it's not about finding a place that no one has been to. It's about when you're in those places, making them your own and making your experience something unique to you. You know, the, the fact is you're probably not going to be taking people to places where uh, no one has ever been before. Uh, most people who are traveling today have had plenty of opportunities to travel in the past. So more and more today's travelers, they're, they're really not looking for you to take them to places that have previously been inaccessible. Instead, what they're looking for you is to show them an experience that they wouldn't have known to pursue on their own, that they wouldn't have known was available, that they wouldn't have had the means to pursue on their own. And so Diana's exactly right. It's not about finding new places. It's about finding new ways to make those places exciting and give people distinctive and unique experiences while they're there. And Diana also shared a very uh, specific technique that she uses to find cool new travel opportunities. She said, keep your ears open when you're at conferences. What are people talking about? And when I'm meeting with people, she said, am I asking them the all important question? Tell me something I don't know. Wow, what an insightful question to ask. And I, I think that really cuts through a lot of the noise that you might hear at conferences as you're sitting down to appointments with travel providers. Because the truth is, if uh, you are just sitting down there and listening to the normal things they have to say, well, you're probably just going to hear about the normal 
travel experiences and attractions that most people who come to their destination take part in. And there's nothing wrong with normal. But if you are on the hunt for something extraordinary, beyond normal, something that's going to be memorable, something that is going to stand out to your travelers and make them want to travel with you again, it may just be as simple as asking a question. Tell me something I don't know. What's something that I haven't done in your destination before? What's something that would surprise me and my travelers that we don't know about the places that you have to offer? It's just as simple as asking some questions. And if you ask those questions, well, you might find that you actually have much better appointments at trade shows. Great stuff there from Diana Heckler. Well, you heard me talking before about the Junk Fee Prevention Act and uh, the overall effort in the federal government to try to do away with junk fees in travel. And that is the topic of today's Hot Minute. Yeah, that's right. The Hot Minute is the portion of each show where I take 60 seconds to give you my unfiltered thoughts on an issue that impacts tourism every day. And today we're going to talk all about resort fees and junk fees and whether they have a place or don't have a place in tourism. So let's put 60 seconds on the clock and get into it. There is no place for junk fees in tourism. There's nobody who likes resort fees, uh, except maybe for the hotel owners who charge them. And I don't think there's anybody who actually believes that those fees are really necessary to pay for hotel operations. You know, for years, people have beat up on airlines for being fee happy. But I'll say this for airlines. At least when an airline charges you a fee, they disclose it up front. And it's for something like baggage or flight cancellation that you have a choice in. Hotel resort fees, on the other hand, are simply extortion. They charge the fees to every guest, whether those people actually use the resort amenities or not. The worst part, though, is that these kinds of junk fees fly in the face of the spirit of hospitality. Our industry should be all about making people feel welcome, not making them feel tricked. And if you don't see a problem using these kind of tactics to separate people from their hard earned money, well, you might just be in the wrong line of work. That's how I see it anyway. You are welcome to disagree with me. And of course, we will still be friends. And hey, agree, disagree, have thoughts, rebuttals, comments, questions. We would love to hear from you. You can send your thoughts, questions, and ideas to podcast at grouptravelleader.com. And uh, I read every email that comes into that address. I would love to know what you think. And hey, you never know. Your thoughts or questions might just be the topic of the next hot minute. And listen, while you're in the mood to give us some feedback, would you do me a favor? Would you go to your favorite podcasting platform? Give us a review give us a rating that is super helpful to us. And hey, while you're there, why not hit that follow or subscribe button so that you get the next episode of Gather and Go automatically in your sleep about two weeks from now. And my thanks to every one of you who has already done that. My thanks as well to Diana Heckler for joining us on the next episode of Gather and Go. I'm going to bring you a conversation with digital marketing expert Chris Cheatham West, who's going to tell us all about how we can build better travel websites. Until then, though, remember this. At the end of the day, we're all on this trip together. So let's make it a good one. See you next time on Gather and Go. Gather and Go is hosted and executive produced by me, Brian Jewell. Our publisher is Mac Lacey. Donya Simmons is our creative director. Ashley Ricks is our circulation manager and graphic designer. Our sales team is Kyle Anderson and Bryce Wilson. To advertise on the podcast, call Kyle or Bryce at 888-253-0455. Gather and Go is a production of The Group Travel Leader. For more information about our magazines, podcasts, and events, visit us online at grouptravelleader.com.